Snow falls softly on new recruits for the Ukrainian Army 3rd Assault Brigade. Drill sergeants push them through their paces with urgent basic training for the trenches, urban warfare and assault maneuvers. Every woman and man counts now for a battle that seems to have returned to the dire days at the start. 28-year-old Serhi came back from Lithuania to serve two weeks ago despite his health. What's wrong with you? Uh, it's asthma. But right now uh, we need to take our best man and no matter what I will I will serve my country until the victory. The brigade says it's training professional fighters, not cannon fodder like Russia. Their soldiers helped evacuate survivors of the battle for Avdivka, where Russia has now raised its flag. But many of their wounded were left behind. Just watch this video call between a severely injured soldier, Ivan, and his panic-stricken sister, Katerina. <laughs> Ivan and his comrades never made it. Ukraine says there was a deal Russia would evacuate them and exchange prisoners. <laughs> Instead, Russia released video of them dead. The brigade says they were shot. These are desperate times in Ukraine's fight to survive. They need to replenish the ranks of the dead and injured. And even here at the Superhumans facility in the western city of Lviv, therapists and prosthetic specialists work around the clock giving these war amputees a second chance and even a return to the front lines. 25-year-old Anastasia Savka is an army sniper. She stepped on a landmine in November near the Zaporizhia front, and she tells me they are scattered there like snowdrops in spring, like daisies in summer. We couldn't get out for a long time because we were under very heavy fire, she tells me. To be honest, we were ready to die there. The attacks were so close, and we were thinking this was the end. Olga Rudneva is CEO of this center, which is supported by a Ukrainian businessman and the American philanthropist Howard Buffett. 80% of the patients are military, many of them multiple amputees. And that's because, Olga says, the wounded cannot get out of the battle zone during the so-called golden hour to save their limbs. People are evacuated for 10 hours by comrades very often because Russians are shelling our medics. So by the time they arrive at stabilization point, we have to cut them high because of the tourniquets. So that's why we have multiple uh, amputations. Not only are they outmanned, they are also outgunned. The gridlock in Congress over military aid is showing up at the front. And time is not their friend. We reach Sergeant Mikola, who's also serving now on the Zaporizhia front line. Do you have enough weapons? Do you have enough people? Do you have enough ammunition? Of course we don't, he says. There is a catastrophic shortage of people, the same with weapons. There aren't enough shells for artillery and tanks, or the tanks and artillery themselves. On a brief hiatus in the rear, they've had to buy their own mortar, small caliber, just for self-defense. Problem is, no ammunition. Anastasia practices perfecting her balance, her endurance, regaining the strength to shoulder her weapons, and she wants to go back to the front. I think anything is possible, she says, but whatever happens, we all need to fight this together because the enemy is advancing. No one wants their children to still be fighting the war they and their parents have been fighting ever since Putin's first invasion a decade ago. 
Now, here in Ukraine, it is not just the soldiers under fire. It is, of course, civilians, including journalists, some 26 of whom have been killed since Russia's invasion of Crimea back in 2014. It's happening in many of the global wars, but perhaps the toll in Gaza is the most appalling right now. At least 88 reporters and media workers have been killed in Israel's offensive on the enclave, and they have died since Hamas attacked Israel on October 7th. That's according to the Committee to Protect Journalists. My next guest knows the pain of this more than almost anyone. Diane Foley lost her son James 10 years ago when he was covering the Syrian civil war and was kidnapped and then murdered by ISIS. Now a committed campaigner to help people like him, Foley has written her story in her memoir, American Mother. And she joins me from London alongside the celebrated author Colin McCann, who wrote the book with her. Welcome to you both. Diane, I, I, you know, I wonder what it took for you <coughs> to distill all the pain and heartbreak that you've been going through to get it down on paper and write a story for everybody else to read about and understand. Well, it took meeting Colin McCann. It really did. I really wanted to tell the story, Christiane, because I, I do think that's a way of keeping people alive, but I really needed a partnership with someone who knew how to do it. So we, um, once we met one another, it became clear that Colm would be the one who could help me do that. And let me ask Colm, why did Diane choose you? I know there's a connection with Jim. Well, it's an extraordinary story, really. Um, on, uh, when, when that iconic photograph uh, was shown across the world in the, uh, 10 years ago of Jim in the Syrian desert in the orange jumpsuit, um, the world was shocked. But at the same time, I was sent a, a, another photograph of Jim at a happier time uh, when he was in a bunker um, and he was actually reading a novel of mine called uh, Let the Great World Spin. And when that happened, for me, all the oxygen went from the air and I felt a connection with Jim. I felt a connection with Diane. And I thought um, that somehow this story um, I, I would become a, a powerful thing, which it did for me uh, seven years later when I actually got to meet Diane. And... Um, came upon one of the most courageous uh, people that I have ever met in my life. And we had a chance then to, to penetrate into the, the dark mysteries of this, um, of this particular story and even get a chance to meet uh, her son's killer together. I'm going to get to that in a moment because that is an extraordinary story which you bookend, the, the, the beginning and the end of the book with that. Um, Diane, I don't know where you got the strength to do that, but first I want to ask you something that really struck me about how you started to get to know Jim better almost after he died. And I want you to read, we've asked you to choose a, pa a passage and read to us uh, from your own heart about how you got to know him through the, the testimonies and the memories of those who had worked and been with him. Sure. Um, years later, after Jim was killed, John and I would realize that we got to know him from the stories of others. Everyone seemed to have a Jim story, and we became the repositories for those stories. I take a sort of solace in this. We get to know him afterwards, and so he lived on. In a way, we are still getting to know him. And another thing you said, Diane, was that for you as a parent, there is no term <laughs> for a parent who's lost a child. Describe that, that thought, because I hadn't even thought about that until I saw it in black and white in your book. Well, um, really, uh, Colm was the one who um, had mentioned that, and I think it's the truth. It's something that none of us as parents ever want to think about. And um, we all want to and expect to go before our children. So. Um, it is true, though, that there is not a term for that. Um, we have, you know, we have yeah. widowers said, and we have widows yeah. and, mm -hmm. and we have orphans and, uh, and yet we have no specific term for that sort of, um, I, I think, that, 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 that terrible grief uh, that, that a parent experiences when, when he or she has lost a child.